That's uh, the native tongue. I'm honored to be here today actually as an extension of uh, Trillium Health Partners. Uh, and I'd like to tell you why we chose uh, Trillium to partner with today as the foundation. Uh, many of you may know someone by extension or as a family member who's been affected with uh, cancer. Thanks to the collective efforts of professionals in the healthcare industry, cancer research centers, organizations, and individual donations, treatment for cancer is rapidly changing. Unfortunately, some people close to us in our immediate community will never live to see the results of this cancer research. This is very much the case for my father, Merdad Mardani. My father was diagnosed with gastric cancer in August 2016. By December 2016, was deemed terminal and passed away in May 2017, which is just six months ago. We spent many days collectively at the palliative care center at our local Trillium facility, which is Credit Valley just down the street. While being at this facility, it was evident to myself and my father and our family how much these people cared, these individuals, how uh, important it was in this last minute of time that these people had a professional team around them. When you know you're not gonna live much longer, it's very important to know that you have this at your fingertips, and we're very lucky to have that. While being in pal palliative care, I had a conversation with my father. I was having a conversation with him in regards to how he was dealing with his terminal disease. He was taking the process remarkably well. I wanted him to understand why. It made no sense. His answer was, to me was clear. He said, love. He was extremely happy. He was only concerned with the good, and somehow, <laughs> Even the bad was a blessing as well. It's this mindset personally I work towards every day. Today, collectively, we'll be, we'll be collecting money on his behalf and we'll donate it to the cancer patients at Trillium for their care um, in the last minutes and last days of their need with their family. So on that note, actually, it's, I take great pleasure to being here and introducing uh, Dr. Reza Tabandeh. Dr. Tabander re received his BA from York University on religious studies. He also finished his master's on Rumi at the University of Toronto, right here. He earned his PhD in Islamic studies in the Institute of Ar Arab and Islamic Studies in the University of Exeter. Dr. Tabander has been invited to many different universities, such as Brock University, the University of Toronto, York University, as well as the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom to lecture. He is currently a lecturer right here at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, on Islam and Sufism. Uh, please put together a warm welcome for Dr. Reza Tabanda. Thank you very much. Your favorite. Cheers, thanks. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be up upon you. I started my talk with a religious phrase that all Muslims start their interaction and conversation with. So theor theoretically, they start their dialogue with peace. I know what is going on in the name of Islam right now. So I have to clarify that I am not here to convince anyone about reality of Islam. I know that many of friends in here have been victims of fanaticism. No one, I mean no real human being, can justify what has been done by ISIS, by Taliban, and many other oppressors and fanatics all around the world in the name of God, which is really bad. Therefore, my purpose is not to talk about them and pollute our conversation with those filthy fanatics' interpretation of Islam. 
So, unfortunately, most of us are familiar with this aspect of religion through media and news. Tonight is a gathering for love and charity and kindness. Tonight, I do not want to convince anyone. Therefore, we won't have any uh, and answer, question and answer at the end. However, if you have any question, you are more than welcome to come to me tonight. Tonight, I want to talk about another interpretation of Islam, an interpretation which, in my opinion, is moderate and tolerant toward others. Although this is one of the interpretation among numerous other interpretation. First of all, I would like to talk about my motivation for this talk. About 20 years ago, my beloved father passed away and we emigrated to this country. Many of you know about the distresses from emigrate, em, em, emigrating to a new country. My family and I could hardly speak a sentence in English and did not know anything about living in a new society. Mr. Mehdad Mardani was our saving angel. He guided us, passed through this sad and shocking state of life or lives. It is really hard to explain who Mehdad Mardani was. He was an encyclopedia of kindness for me. If we divide his first name to two parts, Meher and Dad, the first part, which is Meher, generally means affection and love. But if we go further, it means charity. And the second part is Dad, which means to contribute, to contribute love, passion, and charity. And his personality was perfect manifestation of his name. As he said, last year he was diagnosed with cancer, and after months of struggling with cancer, he passed away. I can say he was a real friend, and now I physically do not have him, but through his memory, he is alive for me. And that is why I dedicated this talk to Agha Mehda. We go back to the talk. A great uh, Sufi poet of 12th and 13th century, Fariduddin Attar of Nishabur, says, the shore of the ocean is all infidelity. Whereas the ocean is all faith, and the pearl in the ocean is beyond faith and infidelity. Therefore, this ocean has lots of filthy shores and stormy shores that one cannot swim in it and discover its reality. However, in the middle or in depth of this ocean, we may find some crystal clear water, and then we may be able to discover the pearl, which is the essence of this ocean. This essence is divinity, which is beyond faith and infidelity. I'm not trying to prove that this is the only true interpretation of Islam. I just want to say this is one of the interpretation among many others. Islam is a religion that its territory expands from China to Canada with wide range of different customs in different societies. All of these different interpretation of Islam varies based on the place and personal understanding of this religion. Some view it from an exoteric base, whereas others look at it through esoteric lenses. As Sachiko Morata says, one of the sources of richness of Islamic intellectual history is the variety of, variety of interpretation provided for a same source of revelation. This book or revelation was a general book that addresses all different types of people, a shepherd, a philosopher, a mystic, a businessman, a scientist, and so on. Who is a Muslim then? A Muslim is one who has submitted to God's will, or one who follows religion of Islam. There is a tradition in Islam which states, one day when we were with God's messenger, meaning Prophet Muhammad, a man with a very white clothing and very black hair came to us. No mark of travel was visible on him, and none of us recognized him. 
sitting down before the prophet, leaning his knee against his and placing his hand on his tithe. He said, tell me, Muhammad, about submission, Islam. So I, I use three words in my talk. You have to know it. What is submission? What is Islam? He replied, submission means that you should bear witness that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is his messenger and that you should perform the ritual prayer and pay alm tax fast during Ramadan and make the pilgrimage to the house if you are able to go there. The man said, you have spoke the truth. We were surprised at his questioning him and then declaring that he had spoken the truth. He said, now tell me about faith, Iman. He replied, faith means that you have faith in God, his angels, his book, his messenger, and the last day, and that you have faith in the measuring out both. It's good and it's evil. Remarking that he had spoken the truth, he then said, now tell me about doing what is beautiful, ihsan. He replied, doing what is beautiful means that you should worship God if you see him, for even if you do not see him, he sees you. In Islamic tradition, this man with a very wide clothing is Angel Gabriel. Therefore, this tradition is called the tradition of Gabriel. This tradition provides us with the picture of the religion of the followers of Muhammad. This tradition suggests that the religion comprises three elements, or better to say, three dimensions. So Islam is kind of a three-dimensional reality. The first is Islam, which is submission and exoteric activities like five daily prayers, fasting, and so on. The second part is Iman, which is faith. And the third dimension is Ihsan. Ihsan is doing what is beautiful. In here, the motivation for this activity is Ihsan as I will talk about it later on during the stock. An act cannot be beautiful if it, it, it does not have any awareness behind it. This awareness is like the spirit of that act. If a body is dead, its spirit is gone. Then it becomes a perishable corpse. It's the same case for doing different acts without awareness. The translation of these three terms are kind of problematic. It is really hard to translate them. We need to discuss them in details. However, the focus of this talk, as I said, is Ihsan. These three terms of Islam, Iman, uh, these three terms, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, have, have a same form in Arabic. These words are the fourth form out of the 15 form of the words in Arabic. This type of the word is about doing something or making something. Islam is making submission happen. Iman is making faith happen. And Ihsan is making beautiful things happen. The root of the word Ihsan is from Hassan, meaning beautiful. That is why one of the meaning of the word Ihsan is to do beautiful acts. It's worth noting that there are many different words for beauty in Arabic, like Jamal and so on. But Hassan and Hosn are related to the eye, to the vision. Hassan relates to the eye, and the idea of Ihsan is also seeing, having vision. That is why that tradition, that tradition says, worship God as if you see him. For even if you do not see him, he sees you. Sashiko Murata and William Chittick have nicely explained these three dimensions, and I will read their quote. When we say Islam has three dimensions, we are implying that it is helpful to think of Islam in a geometric imagery. The spatial reality with which, which we have contact has three dimensions, leaving aside the fourth dimension for the moment. It is possible to study physical reality in one or two or three dimensional terms. And it is possible to study the first dimension independent of the second, or the first and second independent of the third. In other words, we can study reality purely in terms of lines, 
Or we can study it in terms of surface and area. Or we can study it taking depth into account as well. Ehsan is not only doing beautiful acts or helping others. This is a spiritual path. I mean Ehsan is the ultimate goal. Doing good is if you see God. You feel that you are always in divine presence. An individual in divine presence, this is the highest level of human possibility. So if you have this in mind, you automatically do good. Hamza Yusuf says that uh, this is an internal mechanism that is working to prevent you from doing wrong. Let me refer to a funny story by Hamza Yusuf explaining this state. He said there was a guy in New Mexico driving with everybody else about 80 miles per hour. They saw the police. Everybody is slowed down except this guy. And he just kept zooming along with the 80 miles per hour. Cops turned on the light, pulled him over, and asked him, why didn't you slow down like everybody else? He said, I don't want to be a hypocrite. <laughs> Actually, this is a good example. But not this was a joke, but this is a good example. By the presence of authority, our actions are checked. We are and we control ourselves. Why? Because we do not want to be punished. We do not want to be fined or receive points on our driver license. Then if you are in a higher level of consciousness, whenever you see an authority, it is a reminder. It is a reminder for you. It reminds you of your actions. And if you always look for the reminder and you are kind of ashamed, ashamed of what you do, it is the first state among these three, which is the state of Islam, because you are ashamed of the authority. One level higher is the state of faith or iman, that you feel the guilt in your heart. But the, the last level, which is the level of ihsan, it is the highest level or a state that you always see the presence of the authority and you automatically follow the commands. If you always see yourself in divine presence, then your whole life is changed, as I will explain through different aspects of life. The ihsan is a process of purification through doing good and beautiful acts, but you have to be ready for this state and be purified, as Rumi in his Masnavi narrates a story that a foolish person tried to accompany Jesus Christ and told him, teach me that I may do ihsan, that I may do good and beautiful acts by means of it endow the bones with life. Jesus said, be silent, for that is not thy work. This not made for thy spirit and speech, for it wants breath purer than rain and more piercing in action than the angels. By entering into this spiritual state, your act will become ethical. And now again, we can connect it to beauty because ethic, ethics is nothing but aesthetic. Ethic always relates to aesthetics as ethical acts are beautiful. Ethical acts are always harmonious. It is better to say these acts bring back harmony. For example, doing ihsan to your parents was a command in Quran. As Quran in chapter of Isra verse 23 state, and your Lord has decreed that you not worship except him and to parents beautiful and good treatment. So by doing this, the harmony is in family is back. The desire to make beauty is, the, is an innate spiritual organ within all human beings. However, we have to have the ability to manifest it in the world, in all different directions and aspects in this physical world. This even can be manifested in art. Actually, art is something aesthetic. Therefore, 
it is in direct relationship with Ihsan. For example, when you enter the Basilica of, Basilica of Sacred Heart of Paris, Sac de Corps, or Masjid Shah in Isfahan, or Blue Mosque in Istanbul, automatically the beauty, the architecture art of these sacred places will connect you to the world of spirituality. Unfortunately, these beauties are fading away from both extremes. One is re religious fanaticism, which is led by those dry-minded literalists who just look at the exoteric aspect of religion with an exclusivist view, and they destroy all of these beauties. There are many examples. One is the destruction of the, one of the oldest and the most beautiful Buddha in Bamiyan of Afghanistan by Taliban, which was part of Afghanistan heritage. Or what ISIS did to Syrian and Iraqi heritage. On the other hand, we have this industrial modern life, which everything is made to do the job. There is no beauty. By beauty, I mean a spiritual beauty. A spiritual doesn't mean divine beauty, just a spiritual beauty, which is not necessarily connected to divine. Everything becomes so plastic, and just you go to, and just fun functionality becomes important. Sometimes, when you go to one of those hippie stores in downtown, which they sell those uh, Eastern crafts or African crafts, finally you so see yourself attracted to something, to the charm of an object which is so primitive in its outward appearance. But because of the spirit, they are attractive because they are made by hand. So these beauties and arts are life enhancing and embellishes one's life on earth. Unfortunately, we notice the absence of this type of art. We have this aesthetic loss. In those Islamic countries, even exercise, I mean traditional exercise, had their own codes of conduct, ethical lessons, with a sense of brotherly love among them. Right now, we just go to a gym. Okay, I had my, my, I had my own pre-workout supplement. It's healthy, right after my gym, I will have my juice and protein shake. Boom, it's done and we go home. There is no spiritual and friendly and brotherhood or sisterly relationship in these uh, gym or doing exercise. There is no beauty behind it. Let's go back to the act. You may say we do not see Ihsan in Muslim community, and you are right to a certain extent. Quran in chapter of Ali Imran, verse 134, says, who has spent during ease and hardship and who restrain anger and who pardon the people and God loves the doers of good, Mohsenin. This is the key verse for my purpose of this talk in Quran. You may say there are lots of verses about retaliation, which I do not deny, but let me explain this verse. As I already explained, Islam has many different dimensions. The, the legislative and jurisprudential part which is the duty of fuqaha, is for everyone, from an exoteric-minded Muslim who does not have an idea about esoteric part of the religion to a mystic. This is the part which Quran in verse 45 of chapter Maida says, and we ordain for them, they're in a life for life, an eye for eye, and so on. So this is a general rule, which is also mentioned in the codes of Hammurabi before Quran. It is also mentioned in Old Testament, in Exodus and Leviticus book. But if we look at the context of the time, it was kind of limiting the retaliation. Because in the Arab society during that time, that era, the role of society was based on tribalism. Then there were series of bloodsheds and blood feuds for retaliation between two tribes. Therefore, what Sharia did kind of controlled these retaliation and limited it. As many people are not in such an elevated spiritual level, therefore retaliation was allowed. 
What if we go one level higher and enter to the spiritual ethics and have a spiritual approach, then it is a different story. We have to restrain our anger. Then you have to forgive. Then you have to, so you should not retaliate. Then you should not even be angry and you should not, uh, you should forgive. And at the end, God loves Mohseni, meaning those doers of good or doers of Ihsan. This state is the state of the golden rule of Christianity, which actually Ali, Imam Ali said the same thing. One should treat others as one would like others to treat oneself. And it goes to a more elevated state as Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 39 says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them to the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone force you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is exactly what Ihsan means. Returning back to the verse of Quran, the above mentioned verse about restraining anger, represent the three dimensions of Islam, which is Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. The last one, which is doing good or beautiful acts, is one of the most important part of it. It, it is charity, to recognize, and to do these beautiful acts, to recognize beauty, you must be a beauty producer too. You must be a contributor yourself too. This is only achievable through a spiritual development. If you do good, you feel good. Then this is another spiritual mechanism to encourage one to do this. In Islamic tradition, a person would not fulfill, actually Islamic tradition, not in the fanatical sense, but in a spiritual sense. In Islamic tradition, a person would not fulfill in life until they become a person who is Mohsen, for which there are numerous references to them in Quran, which says God loves Mohseni, meaning that God loves beauty makers. So if we just look at Sharia laws or exoteric laws of Islam, which is legislative part of their religion, are the minimum laws of society. Let me give you an example. If somebody, God forbid, kills a member of your family, the Sharia law gives you the right to retaliate. However, it is highly encouraged to forgive. Even clear your heart from the feelings of revenge, which is higher than the state of Sharia. This is not part of Sharia. It is much higher than Sharia. Therefore, Sharia is a general law applicable for everyone. One of the principles of lawgiver, so I'm going back to Sharia because it's for general. It's a general law, it's not only for Sharia. In the world, one of the principles of the lawgiver is to prescribe law according to the ordinary man and not elites or philosophers or any special group in the society. Therefore, these laws must be affordable for everyone. However, if we just rely on that, which some people do nowadays, just relying on Sharia, the danger of literalism, fanaticism, is there. Another example to show different states is zakat. What is zakat? Zakat is a form of almsgiving treated in Islam as a religious obligation or tax which is based on Quranic verses and the importance of zakat is next to after prayers within Islamic tradition. As I said, it is obligatory to pay this alm tax, which is customarily about 2.5% of your uh, wealth. However, this is the minimum you can do. This is what is dedicated by divine legislation. But when we go to other dimension, it is a different story. Let me give you a story of Sheikh Abu Bakr Shebli. Sheikh Abu Bakr Shebli, a 9th and 10th century Sufi saint, once was asked about the zakat of 40 dirhams. And he said, the zakat of 40 dirhams is 41 dirhams. 
And they ask him why. He said, it is 41 dirhams because one dirham is obligatory tax that you have to pay it to those Sharia-minded people. And the rest is which is you have to give all your belongings to help humanity. Therefore, one needs to endow everything to God. But this is the highest estate, like paying the 41 uh, dirhams, because we have to take care of our families too, as it is part of the religious duty. Therefore, these obligatory alms in Islam are only for Sharia part. But for those mystics with gnosis, one needs to give his or her life for humanity. Not only for Muslims, they say khalqullah, for humanity. As it is mentioned in Quran, chapter 9, verse 111, indeed God has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties in exchange for that they will have paradise. In this verse, God does not need to buy anything. But in here, he means those who have faith, their life and wealth belong to God. And Rumi in the second book of Masnavi says, those exoteric sciences, he means fiqh or those sciences, those exoteric sciences do not have any spirit. And they love their clients and customers. Whereas my client is God. And will take me to the estate of indeed God has purchased from the faithful. When someone is in this estate, then he or she is always feel the God's presence. It is not but just what she or it is not what she heard he or she heard from the traditions or what those seminary scholars say in madrasas. But he or she experienced it, experienced it that true heart. And they always see themselves in God's presence, which makes them filled with love and ecstasy. That is why Rumi again referred to this and he says, I have drunk a sherbet from indeed God has purchased that I will be slaked till end of my life. So keep this verse of Rumi in mind. So you should keep this in mind that many people cannot afford this. And that is why it is not part of Sharia. In, in the second chapter of Quran, verse 245, says, who is it that would loan God, loan God a goodly loan, so he may multiply it for him or her many times over. And it is God who withholds and grants abundance, and to him you will be returned. First of all, it's a good uh, investment, will multiply it. But I refer to this verse because we all know God does not need no loan. This is referring to charity and helping others. Therefore, the legislative part is only obligatory tax. But for faithfuls or mystics in higher states of spirituality, their obligation is to sacrifice their life and wealth for the goods of humanity. Endow everything as you are giving it to God. Because a person with vision of God's presence always see her or himself in divine presence. Rumi always attributed doing beautiful act, a son, and endowing beauty to God. That is what majority of religious people do. Religious people, I mean mystic and spiritual people, not fanatics. Rumi in the first book of Masnavi says, the search aspiration in us is also brought into existence by thee, means God. Deliverance from iniquity is thy gift, O Lord. Without or seeking, thou hast given us, thou hast given us gift without number and without end. In Islam mysticism, in Islamic mysticism, the most beautiful being is God, the beloved. Then if you see the most beautiful being, you automatically fall, uh, fall uh, in love. It's automatic. Because when you see a beautiful thing, you feel in love. 
And imagine, when you are in love with someone, you want everything for your beloved. And you want to do anything to make your beloved happy. In this case, the beloved is God. Therefore, one would give up everything to God. But for sure, you cannot give it directly to God. And you can do it through a son. All human beings will become dear for you as they were created by the hand of your beloved. Actually, all creatures. In an intimate divine conversation between God and Prophet uh, Moses, uh, which is called Hadith Qudsi, this divine com the intimate divine conversations are ca called Hadith Qudsi, God said, I was sick and you did not come for, vi for a visit or help. In here, for sure, God does not get sick, but one of his creatures got sick, and Moses had to do a son. However, I should make a quick note that this act is different from civil society. They do not have to be citizen of that society. They can be any human beings. The main purpose is khidmat wa shafiqat be khalqullah, means service and kindness toward God's creatures. As a 10th century Sufi Sheikh, Sheikh Abul Hassan Kharagani, wrote at the door of his Sufi lodge, anyone who comes to this house, give him food and do not ask about his faith, unlike what we have nowadays. He said, anyone who has comes to this house, give him food and do not ask about his faith because as he merits a life next to the exalted God, no doubt deserve a meal on my table. To conclude, so if you, are, if you feel you are in divine presence, which is the ultimate goal, then you are in the presence of your beloved. So when we are aware of the divine in the world. We see divine manifestation in everything and every creature. It becomes really difficult to be an oppressor toward others. It becomes extremely hard to kill innocent people in the name of God. It becomes difficult to be aggressive even toward animals because they are part of the beauty and art created by God. It becomes difficult to pollute our environment, which is not only for us, but for the generations after us. It becomes difficult to destroy the heritage, which belongs to our ancestor living before us and to the generations after us. It becomes difficult not to help those who are in need of our helps. The charity becomes part of your spirit, and automatically you donate your love and wealth to humanity. To end the talk, I would like to thank my friends for helping me uh, for this. I would like to thank Mr. Mehdad Mardani's family for their help, Faranak, Salar, Elias, and Sharon. Elias is responsible to give the ad address of the web page for donation if you want to do, or I think you can take cash too, if they, and then later on give receipt to them. I also ask all of my friends who helped me on this. Uh, I also would like to end my talk with a poem from Rumi. From love, thorn becomes flowers. From love, vinegar becomes wine. From love, bitter becomes sweet. From love, fire becomes love, light. From love, devil, devils becomes anger. From love, fury becomes mercy. From love, dead becomes alive. From love, kings becomes servant. Thank you. <laughs>